Good evening and welcome everyone to What's on the Ballot, the second in our series of three webinars about taking climate action in Massachusetts through state legislation. I'm Kurt Newton from the 350 Massachusetts Boston Node, and also a member of the statewide steering team, and I'll be uh, tonight's moderator. Video of the speakers of this session is being recorded. So if you don't wish to appear when we're into the uh, question and answer mode, uh, just have your uh, you know, you can enter your questions and so forth in the chat. Um, so about this, uh, about this series and about tonight. Uh, in our first session a couple weeks ago, we talked about how the current legislative sessions, climate bills now in conference committee uh, and how we should be building relationships with our legislators to achieve our goals. Tonight, we'll focus specifically on ballot questions as a more direct form of democracy as a way for our individual voices and our votes to be heard more clearly. We're really lucky to have these excellent panelists with us tonight explaining the goals of and the context around several ballot questions. We'll be sure to set aside plenty of time for your questions too and get into some really good discussions. So this year, every voter in Massachusetts will be voting on two binding questions. Tonight, we'll talk about one of those, question two, ranked choice voting and why it promises to create a more representative democracy. And we're glad to have Jim Henderson, vice chair of the Yes on Two campaign, speak on this. We'll also be discussing two non-binding public policy questions, which are on the ballot in many districts around the state. One of these non-binding questions about 100% renewable energy is directly related to climate, while the other one, known as transparency, would make the state house committee votes a matter of public record and thus become make them more accountable to citizens. In collaboration with the group Act on Mass, 350 Massachusetts collected thousands of signatures to get these on the ballot. And we're really glad to have tonight 350 Mass volunteer leader Ben Thompson, 350 Mass legislative manager Cabell Eames, and from Act on Mass, co-founders Matt Miller and Erica Utehoven. Erica is also the Democratic State Rep nominee for the 27th Middlesex District, rep representing Somerville, and happens to be endorsed by our electoral politics uh, sister organization, 350 Mass Action. So I'd like to ask now each of our panelists in turn to introduce themselves briefly, uh, starting with Ben, then Cobble, then Jim, then Matt, and ending with Erica. Uh, ben, would you like to, uh, to kick us off here? Hi, uh, I'm Ben. I, I live in Roxbury. Uh, I've been volunteering with 350 Mass uh, since 2012. I'm a graduate student at BU uh, studying math, and uh, I've been really excited to, to work with uh, many of these lovely folks on these non-binding questions. All right. Thanks. Cobble? Hello. Yes, I'm, I'm really happy to be here. I'm Cabell Eames. I am the legislative manager for 350, and um, I got to work with all of these wonderful people, Ben and Matt, getting these questions on the ballot in some of your districts, and I'm really excited to talk about them and what they could mean for the future. Thank you. Uh, Jim. Good evening, everyone, and thank you all uh, for uh, inviting me to participate in this, uh, this fantastic forum. Uh, as, as mentioned, I am the vice chair as well as the general counsel and treasurer of the Yes on Two campaign. Uh, I was one of the founders of Voter Choice Massachusetts, the uh, organization that got started about four years ago and, and then morphed eventually into the campaign. And I've been an advocate of ranked choice voting for now just shy of two decades. So this has been a, a long road for me, but an exciting one, and look forward to telling you more about question two later on. Right. Matt? Yeah, I'm Matt Miller, uh, he, him pronouns. I live in Brighton um, in Boston, and I'm one of the co-founders of Act on Mass with Erica and uh, got to experience the joys of collecting signatures during a pandemic with a lot of the folks on the um, on the panel here, Cabell, Ben, and, and others. And uh, just thank, excited to be here, and thanks for having me. Yeah, great that you're with us. And then Erica. Hi everyone, I'm Erica Eiderhoven. Um, so I'm co-founder of Act on Mass with Matt Miller. 
Um, and I'm currently the Democratic nominee for the 27th Middlesex in Somerville. Um, I was very lucky to have collected all my signatures before the pandemic happened. Um, so unfortunately did not get to share the joys of collecting uh, e-signatures, but I'm very happy to be with you all. Thank you so much. Great. Okay. Um, yeah, really excited to, uh, to be able to, um, to run through these three ballot questions with you all. Uh, I think we're gonna, we wanna begin with, um, um, uh, actually, Erica, can I ask you to, um, to, to, to say a little bit more about, I understand that, uh, uh, that, uh, you know, your motivation for running for office in part was, uh, was uh, was spurred by this transparency question. I thought that might be uh, might be an interesting way to kick us off. You know the uh, the skin in the game that you've got here, so to speak. Sure. Yeah. No. I'm happy to do that. So. Um... Yeah, no, so again, I mean, I ran, you know, I ran um, and won the Democratic primary. It was actually one of the second largest margins for an open seat in Massachusetts. And it was very much thanks to the support of climate activists, including 350, as well as many of our partner organizations, Sunrise Movement, Sierra Club, all of which have also endorsed, um, you know, both these like questionnaires as well as the Act on Mass Pledge, which is, is very kind of similarly um, bound. And we'll, we'll talk more about that. Um, but, you know, I'm very excited to just share the space with you all, um, particularly both in terms of just the fact that, you know, underlying all the issues of transparency, uh, you know, uh, sorry, underlying all issues are the issue of transparency and, you know, climate crisis is just one of many. Um, but, you know, the climate crisis and the lack of action in the state house for over 12 years, right, is, you know, why we're in the emergency we're in right now. Um, and, you know, really groups like 350 are the backbones of ensuring, you know, Massachusetts passes the Green New Deal as part of a just recovery from COVID-19 um, and transition towards eliminating all greenhouse gases and getting to 100% renewable. Um, and so, you know, that I'll, I'll share a little bit around the, the transparency piece and, and, you know, why it's so, so important. Um, I mean, transparency, like I said, is underlying kind of all of the issues that we see in the state house. And you literally can take any issue um, whether that's, you know, economic justice, wealth and income inequality, whether that's reproductive rights, immigrant rights, racial justice and climate, um, you know, the climate crisis, they are all underlying all of this. Um, and, you know, I'll, I'll just start with just saying, like, you know, a lot of people ask me, like, why should I care about the state, right, versus the federal? We could be fighting for all the things I just listed at the federal level. Um, and, you know, I'll just share, you know, the state is actually incredibly crucial and important, and that actually has been highlighted incredibly vividly right in the past few days um, when you know this eviction moratorium that was lifted over Saturday which is opening a floodgates of hundreds of thousands of evictions um, and this is a just one of many examples but this is I think a particularly pertinent one that just happened literally a few days ago um, where our state house including the house the senate the governor did an incredibly horrific immoral act which was to do nothing Right, and it's the same with the climate crisis. They have done nothing. Um, and this is despite us having a supermajority veto-proof legislature um, that could do something, right? Um, and that's just, you know, just to highlight that there's so much of, um, I, I like to quote abolitionist Ruth Wilson Gilmore around, you know, the two evils that have exacerbated through this pandemic and really put on full display, which is organized, or state organized abandonment and state organized violence, right? Eviction is, is violence and, and not doing anything about the climate crisis is violence. Um, and this is all happening at the state level and it's all happening behind the shroud of lack of transparency um, in the state house. There's no accountability. Um, and I'll just share just like on a very, you know, as an example of someone who's elected and representing now, right? Um, you know, groups like 350 put together these incredibly important questionnaires, very thoughtfully put out, you know, asking me really critical questions about the climate crisis. And this is the case of whether they take unions, reproductive groups, all that. And I answer these questionnaires. Um, and the reality is when I enter the building next year, I don't have to show anyone my work. Right. I don't actually have to prove that I actually did anything about all these issues that I wrote about and responded to you all. And you all made a really important decision around who do you support and who do you help elect. And yet the reality is, if we do nothing, there's no way for you all to hold me accountable. Uh, imagine doing a job. Right. Think of all the jobs you've held in your life. Um, when 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 did you not have to share with other people your own work? Right. Um, and you have to do that with any, any job. And that's, it's really absurd that the state legislature, they're largely left to 
do whatever they want. Um, there's no reason to have accountability. And it's, it's this wild sort of like promises. And then saying that, you know, it's um, the hierarchy of the state house is what actually reigns true, not what the interests of the voters are. Um, and I'll just share really quickly too, because what's at stake for me is, you know, beyond you know, all the issues are so important, the transparency that's underlying it, but there's also, um, underlying all of that, right, is a state house that is undemocratic, hierarchical, um, and completely um, devoid of listening to their constituents. It's largely, it's, and it's an incredibly corrupt institution, right? There's no kind of voice and there's no accountability. There's no way to actually demand what you demand in terms of what we need to advocate for in the public sphere and largely who they represent are corporations. Uh, behind closed doors. And so, you know, underlying even like transparency for me is this need and to fight to shift the culture and to expect that of all of our legislators, right? It does take courage to shift a culture. It does take courage to actually change an institution, but that's at stake right now. Because if we do nothing, we're going to pass another 12 years with no climate crisis action. We can't, we can't, we can't even survive that, right? There's no like question, especially when it comes to the climate crisis. And that's the same with housing. Um, it's the same with reproductive rights, with the Roe Act, no, no action, right? And we're seeing what's happening in DC. Um, it's the same with if we include, if we just let everything continue as they go, we're going to see much worse wealth and income inequality than we've seen even now. Um, so these are all the issues that are at stake and underlying that is this need to change how the state house works. Um, so I'm just incredibly excited to, you know, share this space with you all and discuss these ballot initiatives and the work that everyone, you know, at 350 and Act on Mass did, because it's really another, it's a step towards getting to change the state house and really hold our reps to, accountable, underlying all these important issues that we all care about, um, climate being one of them, and as well as all the issues that we mentioned. So um, thank you so much. Yeah. yeah, thank you. All right. The scene is very well set. And uh I you know, appreciate you know your uh, your insight and your uh, your uh, enthusiastic words there. Thank you. Um, all right, so um, Ben and Kabul, would you um, would you like to start us off here and uh, run through this 100% uh, renewable energy ballot question? I want to um, tell our participants that um, please do drop your your questions in the chat as we're going along as you think of them. We'll pause briefly at the end of each of the three sections that we're doing on each ballot question. We'll take, you know, a couple, you know, limit it to just a couple of questions at that point, and then uh, also throw it open at the end, you know, for a, a kind of broader discussion. Discussion. So, um, with that, uh, Ben and Cobble, please take it away. Thanks. Yeah. So I think I'll I'll just talk for a moment about uh, what sort of brought us here, and I mean. Uh, can't say it better than than Erica, and you know, climate change is just one example of of this issue. And so for us in in 350 Mass, you know, there hasn't been uh, significant uh, climate legislation at the state level since 2008, and 350 Mass has formally been ex in existence since since 2012, which is also when I when I when I joined, and it's been incredibly frustrating. Uh, you know, living in this uh, supposedly progressive state uh, where we should be passing progressive policies and we aren't. And I think um, uh, two years ago was a, a bit of a tipping point uh, or a breaking point um, where it, it became clear that lobbying our representatives um, just wasn't going to cut it. It's a necessary part of our work. But when uh, a majority of the House uh, publicly endorses uh, your legislation um, and it, it doesn't pass because it never gets voted on. Um, the idea that, well, maybe if we had, you know, 10 more people publicly endorse, is that, uh, is that what is going to uh, make the difference? Maybe not. And so, um, we started talking about ballot initiatives more generally and um, eventually settled on the idea of, of running, uh, running uh, the transparency question, uh, which our uh, Act on Mass friends will talk more about. And, but as long as we were doing that, it seemed prudent to also run um, this climate question, 
Uh, and it did prove to be, um, I think, an excellent tool in, in starting conversations with people since it's something they're already familiar with. In writing the question, we, we did keep it intentionally a little vague because we know that um, a non-binding ballot question uh, isn't really the place to hammer out nitty gritty policy uh, issues. Uh, we wanted a question that was, was easy to understand and basically said, we, we want uh, the bold climate action uh, that science says we need. One thing we did wanna make sure we included though uh, was um, we wanted to make it clear that, you know, whatever policy, a specific policy ends up getting enacted, we need those policies um, to make sure that uh, the benefits of uh, clean energy are felt by uh, regular folks. Uh, and that means a lot of different things. That means, you know, we shouldn't call it renewable uh, when uh, someone wants to burn trash uh, next to a community uh, that's a community that we've burnt coal next to uh, for 50 years. Uh, it means, you know, currently uh, renewable energy prices are comparable with, with fossil energy prices. And those, the clean energy prices uh, continue to drop. And as they continue to drop, we need uh, those savings to be uh, passed on to uh, consumers and ratepayers. Um, all the you know, fossil fuel infrastructure that's being constructed now by uh, the utility industry uh, that no one is ever going to use. Uh, we need to make sure that those costs aren't passed on uh, to uh, consumers and ratepayers. And um, and so that's 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 you know why we're running this question, and that's that's what we you know along with the important transparency piece, what we hope it can do. Um, thank you, Ben. Uh, Kabul, what's uh, what's your perspective on this situation and on this on this initiative, this question in particular? Well, I mean, it was really great, I have to say. I mean, it was hard to obviously collect signatures in a pandemic, but we got to have some really wonderful conversations with people that when I've collected signatures in the past, normally just to get a candidate on the ballot, it's really quick. You know, you show up in these spaces where there are hundreds of people, generally marches, that sort of thing, and you just hold your clipboard out and you get signatures. Whereas uh, we had to be really intentional about collecting these signatures because there it was a pandemic. And so we were very creative with um, tables that had two different cups, one for dirty pins, one for clean pins. We wore gloves, we wore masks. We were practically in hazmat suits in July, standing outside of farmer's markets collecting signatures. But it was really wonderful to be able to talk to people about the questions themselves. And so Sam, I know that you have a PowerPoint if you just wouldn't mind sharing it because I, I want people to see what those questions are. And then we can kind of talk a little bit about um, just like the, the, the possibilities there. Um, and so we do have them in 19 districts. And one of, and that question is, shall the representative for this district be instructed to vote in favor of legislation that would require Massachusetts to achieve 100% renewable energy use within the next two decades, starting immediately and making significant progress within the first five years while protecting impacted workers and businesses. And we felt that that last part about protecting businesses and workers was really important because we know that just from data around environmental issues, um, it the conversation quickly sometimes go to the the elitist. You know, oh, this is this is like people that want you to buy expensive solar panels and everybody get an electric car and change their light bulbs and everything's wonderful. Um, and so, but we know that that's not true, right? We know that we are going to need to significantly cut back on fossil fuels if we are going to meet the requirements that came out in October of 2018 from the IPCC report that said that we had to drastically get off of fossil fuels um, and that we, you know, by 2021, we'll have nine years to do so. So when things happen quickly, we didn't want it to happen recklessly. 
And with the Green New Deal, that's one of those wonderful things that came out of federal legislation that was all about jobs. And um, it's so scary to the environment, to the fossil fuel industry. I have to tell you that they have created this um, organization. There's several, but there's one that's called the Empowerment Alliance, and it's out of Kentucky. And it's a C4 that is all about the tax scams of the Green New Deal and the environmental movement. And it is a huge organization that is really trying to um, scare us into thinking that you know we can't afford to get off of fossil fuels and um, it's just gonna tax us into oblivion. And I can tell you, nothing can be further from the truth. Renewable energy is really cheap. Um, it's cheap, so cheap that there is a city in Texas that is a red city, that mayor is a Republican and they get all of their electricity from wind farms because it's very cheap and their, um, their community is mainly retired people. And so um, it, is, it is astounding what has come out of technology since we found out about this crisis, which actually was in the late 80s. Um, and so we, they really just need to be incentivized to a certain point. But I mean, we have 12 cities right here in Massachusetts that have already passed 100% renewable energy goals. Um, and so, and they have come to understand, I'm on the energy committee in my own town, we get information that tells us that if we install solar panels, um, we can generate 47% of our Massachusetts electricity. There are people that call the uh, jet stream where Massachusetts is located, the Saudi Arabia of wind. That if we had the wind turbines in uh, those waters, that we would be able to not only generate enough electricity for Massachusetts, but that we would be able to sell it and make profit. So, um, and, I, and I also wanna say that other states have actually passed renewable energy goals, that being uh, New York, Hawaii, uh, Washington, Oregon, and Virginia just passed, and that's where I'm from. And let me tell you, it's, that's a red place. Even though it's all blue now, it is, it's, it's, uh, <laughs> it's not as um, friendly as you would think to environmental policy, um, but my goodness, they just passed a huge Virginia Clean Economy Act, which um, is going to generate a lot of wind power for Virginia too. So the leaders that are getting this are moving and they're moving quickly. And we really wanna see that happen here in Massachusetts. And as Erica said, it's a stalemate legislation. So, I mean, we just threw up our hands and didn't really know what to do except to get these non-binding questions in the 19 districts that we got them, but they're not just for legislators. I want people to think past that because this is data for your city or town that you can always use going forward when they're talking about zoning, if they're talking about libraries or schools or anything that is getting reconstructed. Um, this is a data point that you can always use that says the residents say X. And I think that that's really important because let me tell you, the technology is there to get us where we need to be. We just lack the political will. So if we had more people like Erica in our legislature, things would happen and they would happen fast. Yes. <laughs> totally, totally get it. Agree. Um, thank you, Kevin. Um Let's see. Are there any specific questions from uh, from our attendees on uh, on this question in particular, or any of the things that uh, Ben and Kamal were talking about? Don't see anything specific, but I have I have one that I've always wondered about. Um, how did you go about figuring out which which districts to to target to go after? For getting these on the ballot, I know that that was complicated in some ways by the by the COVID situation. But um, yeah, how how did you how do you think about that when you're doing a district level ballot campaign? Well, the pandemic certainly played a role. <laughs> I mean, when we when we first started out, it was like 81 81 districts. Let's do it. Yeah, we've got people there and. You know, let's look at a calendar and, and what uh, what things are going to be happening outside where we can collect signatures. I mean, we had like a, a huge vision for this that went really big to really, really, really small as the pandemic um, happened. And we were lucky to be able to get um, an attorney who was able to fight for us and get electronic signatures. 
So without that, because basically it was just a volunteer standing in hazmat suits outside of farmers markets trying to get signatures and or, or on uh, or on street corners, you know, flagging people down saying, hey, hey, hey. So once we were able to do that, the floodgates opened, but the problem was we had maybe 10 days to do it. So it was a fast turnaround. So some, you know, these are in districts where um, the representatives are friendly. It's actually in Erica's district as well. So it works in twofold. It works in the sense of um, this legislator vote on renewable energy, please fight for renewable energy. But on the other side of it, it is my district wants me to do this. This question passed, you know, 85%. Therefore, as a legislator, I have to listen to my constituents. But so yeah, it was kind of a potluck. What we got is what we got, but we were just thrilled to do it because in a pandemic, let me tell you, it was, it was a challenging endeavor. Yeah, yeah. Is there, a, is there a list that can be shared with people specifically which cities this question is in, which, which districts and which cities? Um, yes, and it's in DeLeo's district. Yes, it's in DeLeo's yeah. and Tom Golden, which is really important. So he's in Lowell. And he is the chair of the TUE committee, which is where all of our renewable energy bills go to die. So if we can pass this uh, favorably in high numbers in his district, it will really send a signal. I will tell you that he fought to get these questions off of his district because he is also up for re-election. So his name also appears on the ballot in this district. Um, but yes, Sam just shared where the questions are in the chat for people to see. But Tom Golden is, an, is a really important one. And we're actually doing literature drops up in his area in his neck of the woods to educate people about the question, which has been actually really great because I've had some really nice conversations with people about all the questions, which is why I'm glad Jim is here from Yes On Too, because I've been answering some questions on that as well. But um, yeah, it's it's in leadership districts, and so yeah, get the word out. All right, thanks. Um, all right, I'd like to uh, to shift now to um, to the transparency question. Um, Matt and Erica, um, the floor is yours to uh, to bring us in and tell us uh, what what we should know about this question specifically. Awesome, thank you so much. I'm going to share my screen. Give me one second here. Uh, please, somebody give a give a holler if it's not showing up. But hopefully, you'll see that. Um, and so, um, <clears throat> I first want to take a step back before I talk about the question and just sort of recap some of what actually Cabell, Ben, and Erica have already done a really good job of explaining. And I just want to highlight three issues that really, um, to me, seemed like no brainer progressive, even in some cases, not even particularly progressive policies, just common sense policies that I thought um, when I started to really pay attention to state politics back in 2017, three issues that I thought, wow, okay, we've got democratic supermajorities in both houses. I know we have this Republican governor, but gosh, this is these should be three bills that um, I could dip my toes in the water of seeing how our the legislative sausage is made in Massachusetts, and then and then probably, you know, they'll pass all these bills really quickly, and and I will be able to focus on other issues. So the first of those was immigrant rights. Obviously, with Trump being elected and his really racist, outrageous immigration policies, um, I saw the Safe Communities Act as a pretty obvious piece of legislation that Massachusetts should be able to pass pretty quickly. It would prevent local law enforcement from being deputized by ICE, prevent local law enforcement from uh, any of their resources from being used for federal immigration. Um, the second issue was climate change. And exactly as Ben said, um, I had noted that there hadn't been uh, serious, bold climate legislation passed since 2008. Um, that was, I think, the Global Warming Solutions Act. And so looking around, I, I thought 100% renewable energy um, especially um, given that we are the Saudi Arabia of wind, uh, which is what I just learned. Um, I thought this would be an obvious piece of legislation that, that our state would, would want to take up quickly and our legislature would want to pass. Um, and then, frankly, a, an issue that I think um, almost everyone in the state can agree on, um, our sex education laws are actually 
um, a little outdated in Massachusetts. It's not, um, the sex education laws in Massachusetts don't require sex ed to be LGBTQ positive. Uh, you're, there's no requirement to teach consent. We are behind a lot of other states, including red, blue, uh, purple states on this. And so these, the, the Healthy Youth Act would actually fix that. Um, and so I thought, wow, okay, these are three pieces of legislation which uh, make a lot of sense to me. Um, I've put some footnotes here to show that you know, Massachusetts has one of the lowest support levels for Trump in the country. Polls routinely show that these issues are really, really popular. 78% um, of, of voters supporting major uh, regulation to combat climate change and, and whatnot. And so these three bills really to me seemed like no brainers that I'd go to a hearing or two, maybe talk to my rep and then watch them get signed into law. But last session, all three of them were defeated. All three of them were actually sent to study. Uh, they were killed in the committee. Um, and it's not just that they were killed in that one session, but these are issues that have um, many, many years history of not making any progress. So before the Safe Communities Act, it was called the Trust Act. That, that issue has been on the radar of our state legislature for eight years, climate change 12 years since 2008. Um, the Healthy Youth Act was actually introduced by then state Senator Catherine Clark. She is now one of the most senior members of the House of Representatives in DC. Um, it's that's how long this has been going on. Um, and so it really made me take a step back as part of why Erica and I founded Act on Mass was this puzzle of our voters and, and um, polling shows that these policies are very popular. There are democratic super majorities that could put these bills into, into law. So why, are it, why is that not happening? And so um, bear with me for a second while I give you the very basic schoolhouse rock which I'm sure everyone on the call knows, but for a bill to become a law, you need a, a state rep or state senator to actually write the bill and file it. Uh, it goes to a committee where they hold a hearing, they discuss the merits, you have people coming in in favor of the legislation, those who have concerns with it. Um, and then the committee is supposed to make a vote on a new draft of the bill. They might make some changes to the original draft, but uh, generally they should, they should take the time to listen to testimony and then either pass the bill or uh, make changes or, or outright reject it. And then it would go to both chambers, the Senate and the House, where again, we have uh, lopsided democratic supermajorities. These, um, I, I'm noticing now these charts are a little bit out of date. The Senate has actually only got four Republicans now. Um, so it's 90% democratic um, and the House is over 80%. Um, and so even if a bill went to the, the governor's desk and he didn't particularly like it or wanted to veto it, um, it'd be very easy to get that two thirds supermajority to override it. So in broad brushstrokes, fairly simple process. And you would think that that would, these bills that I just laid out would be pretty easy to, to get through that. But what we find really, if you study what's happening in the legislature is there's one really big barrier. Um, there are multiple barriers, but there's one big barrier that I'm gonna talk about right now, which is that committee step. Um, we actually, that logo, that little graphic that I've put up there of green check marks and red X's, it's actually not how it normally is. There are, um, there is not an easy way for you to tell how um, a vote went in committee. Uh, I'm sure if I asked folks to raise their hands who's gone to a legislative hearing uh, in the state house, I'd probably get a lot of hands shoot up. But how many of you have actually seen the committee vote on a bill, which is another one of their tasks in public? Uh, it just doesn't happen. That information is not shared publicly. And um, we're actually in a minority of states that don't make committee votes public. Um, the graphic on the right-hand side here shows when the Safe Communities Act was, was killed in 2018. Um, this is all we know about how people voted. They did not release the uh, votes of who voted in favor or against the bill. Um, there were three, uh, three legislators who took the step of going to the clerk's office and writing that they supported the bill, that they opposed uh, sending it to study. Um, and so, you know, this is really a head scratcher. This is a committee that's 80% Democratic. If I'm, if I want to persuade my state rep or my state senator to fight hard uh, to pass this legislation, I'm actually kind of at a loss to know who to even go to. Who are the people who need to be persuaded? It really takes uh, my power away as a resident, as a constituent, really makes all our activism much harder. Um, and this, uh, as, as Cavill and uh, Ben mentioned, this affects many of our progressive priorities. Um, the 100% renewable energy bill was originally, I think it was originally filed in 2017 and it was killed. We don't know 
how the vote in committee went. It had to be reintroduced this year, uh, this past session uh, in 2019, and it's still in committee. It is not going anywhere right now. It's it's uh, essentially dead, all all in uh, all all but in name, um, and it'll have to be reintroduced next year. Um, and also to, to preempt a little bit what Jim's going to be talking about, there I, I checked and there is a local option bill for ranked choice voting that was filed last session, uh, got a lot of co-sponsors, was killed, sent to study, was reintroduced again this session, and it's still in committee. So it's a very frustrating, unclear, opaque process, um, and it really robs us of our agency. So that's a that's sort of a setting the stage for for this question and, and the transparency the democracy question that we we settled on with 350 was shall the representative for this district be instructed to vote in favor of changes to the legislature's rules that would make the results of all votes in committees of the legislature publicly available on the legislature's website um, and that uh, you can see the little box I put down there how could you how could you vote no on this I think for most people reading this question it's probably more likely that they're gonna say, what, that's not already the case rather than oppose it. Um, and that's really what we were looking for. We wanted something that um, would be impactful and also uh, get a large majority of voters to support it. Um, as a way of comparison, this is a question that two MIT students put on the ballot in Bob DeLeo's district back in 2018. Um, it was about reestablishing term limits, limits on legislator pay and lobbying activities. And the speaker opposed this. There were editorials in the Winthrop local paper saying this is just designed to embarrass our, our speaker, our state rep, so please vote no. And even despite that oppositional campaign, it still passed two to one in a very lopsided manner uh, in Winthrop and Revere. And so that's really what we were looking for is a question that would be impactful and also uh, give those strong, that strong indicator to the representatives that, that we expect them to, to take action. So I'm gonna turn it over to Erica right now. Hopefully she can screen share. Folks see my screen? All good? Okay, great. Yeah, so um, yeah, thank you, Matt. That was you know a great summary of just the, the, the ballot question itself. And then I'll just share a little more insight kind of to complete, um, you know, what are the kind of different problems, right, in the state house? Because, um, you know, I'm just gonna pull up here again, the, this is the, you know, original schoolhouse rock, you know, committee vote is not the only problem. There's actually, um, you know, there is, uh, people ask me like, you know, how is this possible, right? Like, why are we the minority of states that do this? Um, and it turns out Massachusetts's legislature is one of the few governing bodies in the United States um, that writes their own rules. Right, um, and there's actually, uh, I wanna share this all with you because there's going to be a vote um, in late January, early February of next year. It has to happen before anything else happens in the legislature. They cannot vote on anything else until they have voted on their own rules. But interestingly, Massachusetts, uh, the legislature is one of the few governing bodies that writes their own rules and has full control over doing so. So um, I, I bring that up because a lot of people say, wait a minute, my city council, my school committee, they have to actually abide by open meeting law. Is that not the same for a state legislature? And the reality is it's not, because again, we write our own rules and we have not subjected ourselves to things like open meeting law or public records. Um, and so as a result, things like votes are, are not public record as, as Matt just shared. Um, so I just wanted to share a few more things that's in the rule book that really is how this you know, hierarchical system of the state house kind of maintains its control, right, over, over you know, not letting constituents have their voices heard and largely being a very top-down structure. Um, and so, you know, one, of course, we just mentioned, you know, the secretive committee votes, right? So this is where, um, you know, we are in the minority of states that do that. And actually, funnily enough, uh, our state Senate does, their state Senate only committees post their votes online publicly. So this is very specifically to the House issue as well as joint committees when they're House and Senate members. Um, a second thing that I uh, wanted to share also is this off the record floor vote problem. Um, so there is a lot of votes that take place in the Massachusetts legislature, but they're actually not recorded. Um, and they're called voice votes, where uh, essentially, you know, the, the chair of residing over the, you know, House chamber when all 160 of us are in there, um, says, all right, the I say I, the nays say nay, the nays have it. And a lot of times they don't even actually wait to hear eyes and nays, they just kind of call it because they're basically doing what, um, you know, the speaker and, you know, House leadership have told them to do. 
Um, and so as a result, um, why, you know, you're probably asking like, so then how do we get these recorded votes on the floor? Um, you know, we currently require 10% or 16 state reps to stand at once to get a recorded vote on anything they're voting on. Um, it is one of the highest thresholds in the country. Um, and as a result, um, I don't know if you've ever tried to get your state rep to agree to do one very specific thing. Um, imagine trying to ask 16 reps to coordinate and do one thing at once, right? It's a very uh, big organizational struggle. And then finally, um, another big kind of way that you know, the state house maintains its control over um, particularly its rank and file members is that there's actually no time to review legislation. Um, and actually I have, a, these are the emergency rules that we are currently governed by right now. It literally writes in them that we have five hours to read hundreds of pages of legislation and file amendments in response to that. Um, so you can imagine like in those five hours, if you even have those five hours available, which by the way, we don't get to plan around, um, you know, you're just control effing through the whole, you know, document looking for something that might be bad or you want to change. But that's just not a way anyone can legislate, um, you know, functionally. And so I just wanted to share those kind of rule books and also what Act on Mass is, is planning to do about it. So, um, you know, we are organizing this thing called the Transparency is Power campaign. So kind of leading as a next step with the, com the committee votes um, ballot question is that we also want to make these demands the rule changes, right? Like these are, these are non-binding ballot questions, um, but we want to use these questions as a jumping board to say, okay, when we vote on these rules, which will be in late January, February, so in a few months from now, um, we actually want these rules to become the actual rule, right? We don't just want to talk about committee votes being public. We want to actually make committee votes public. Um, so naturally, you know, one of our demands is committee minutes must be public, right? This is a no brainer. It's very hard to argue with. Um, it's ridiculous that our, our state house still doesn't do that. Um, but we also wanted to address the other two problems that I mentioned in the earlier slide um, around both giving us enough time to actually legislate. Um, if they release a bill on the climate crisis, I would like to have more than five hours to be able to read the bill, understand it, you know, talk to Cabell, talk to other um, organizations and say, hey, what are the changes we should make? How do we make this bill stronger? And how can I file amendments to make these changes to the bill? Um, and five hours is just not enough time for anyone to do that. 72 hours would be, and that's our second uh, demand. And then uh, finally, you know, with the need to have recorded votes on the floor, um, you know, we're asking to reduce the threshold from 16 to eight reps. Um, that still puts us much above most states. Most states have usually two, three, maybe five reps needed to get a recorded vote. So we're still above that, but it'll be a massive improvement from needing 16 reps, which is incredibly challenging. Um, and so essentially, you know, our strategy moving forward um, through January and February um, is that we want to, you know, continue a lot of the work we did in terms of, you know, collecting signatures, engaging uh, voters and engaging um, grassroots groups, right, in various districts, um, identify um, constituents and districts across the state to stand up for transparency and make these demands that are listed right here of their reps, right? Because now is our chance between now and February or January, you know, until early next year for us to ask our reps, you or not to ask, demand your reps, right? To say you need to vote for these changes when they come up in the rules, because they will happen. It will happen before anything else happens in the state house. Um, and so, you know, we want to ensure that we're actually uh, mobilizing and training constituents to have what is a healthy and transparent, right, and accountable relationship with their constituent legislature, you know, the constituent legislator relationship. So it's really critical that, you know, we're mobilizing constituents. Um, this is the problem with sort of lobbying, right? Um, lobbyists don't have power over their reps, but I work for my constituents. That's who my boss is. Um, and so we really want to ensure that we're organizing constituents in various districts to demand that of their rep. Um, and then, you know, have, you know, sort of these meetings with the legislators and, you know, organize and raise awareness so that people, you know, understand their rep is responsible to vote in favor of these changes because these changes are so critical for us to have a functioning democracy in the state house. Um, and so I'll just share really quickly in terms of the, you know, history behind this campaign, kind of the arc of what's going on. Um, you know, back in um, January 2019, we were in a very similar position as we were are now, right? So two years ago in the previous session, they also voted on the rules. Again, it happens at the beginning of every session. Um, and, you know, John Hecht, uh, who is, you know, been, uh, he's stepped down and Steve Owens, who was also 350 endorsed, uh, took his seat. 
Um, but you know, he basically filed these rule changes um, to ensure that committee votes be public. So there was a vote on, on these committee um, votes being public. And you know, unfortunately that amendment to the rules that John had proposed uh, was voted down 49 to 109. Um, now that looks bad, but that's actually quite good because if you think about it, almost 50 reps uh, already voted saying, yeah, yeah, of course, we will make committee votes public. And so when you add on, um, you know, the, the ballot questions, right, which are in, in several districts, and, you know, if we have organizing happening in various other, you know, I'll call them swing districts in terms of transparency, right, to push their reps to get over the 81 threshold, we can actually change the rules to be more transparent, more democratic, less hierarchical. Um, so that's, you know, something that's just come from, you know, back in January 2019, you know, Act on Mass was founded uh, right before that. Um, and we essentially, you know, launched this Voters Deserve to Know pledge um, that where we ask state legislators to just make their own committee votes public. Um, I think a lot of you are familiar with this pledge already, so I won't bore you all, but, um, you know, and to also, you know, stand in roll call for bills that they've co-sponsored. Um, you know, we have, um, you know, 16 reps who have already signed that as well as support from, um, you know, labor and, and environmental and climate activist groups um, across the state. Um, and then finally, you know, we have the 16 districts uh, that are going to vote on transparency. So again, this will, you know, help us get to that 81 we need and ensure that uh, these aren't just non-binding questions, but they will change how our rules are written in the state house and how power um, is brokered in the state house. Um, so I just wanted to uh, make a very quick pitch to, uh, if you want to continue this work uh, in terms of joining our campaign, you're going to be organizing across the state. Um, you know, you can become a you know regional organizer or district lead. Um, so we've put in a little you know description of sort of the two roles that we're currently recruiting for. So if you're interested in getting involved, um, you know, to kind of the next step after you know election day, uh, please do reach out. Um, and so I'll put the link right after this. Um, but again, there are no requirements, kind of like the ballot questions in terms of, you know, organizing experience, you know, you just, you need a strong belief uh, for principled uh, justice, right, principled struggle for our state house to be democratic, to be accountable to their constituents and their voters. Um, and we will provide all the trainings and resources necessary um, for this campaign. So um, we will, let me just switch to the next slide. This is the bit.ly. Um, and I'll also put this in the um, chat so that folks can look at link on it and you can sign up uh, for, for the next stage of this campaign. So I'll just put that in there now. Um, and then I'll pause if there are any questions. I know we, Matt and I went over a lot of kind of technical stuff, but um, maybe we'll kind of open it up for a second in the chat if anyone is curious, uh, just in terms of the yeah. next work. Yeah, thanks. Um, there was one question a, a bit ago from uh, from John Brown. Do the committees theoretically vote to kill bills or do they theoretically never take a vote at all? Not sure that it makes a practical difference, but it was curious. Um, Matt, do you want to take that or I'll, I'll yeah, take I get, it? I mean, they, they for for all um, for all legislation, they do have to have a vote. Um, sometimes it is rushed. Sometimes it is quick and done over email, but there is a vote. And so they should be able to make that public. Okay. Yeah. Good. Yeah, I wanna, um, that's the only question I see specifically in here. Um, there was a question way, way back at the beginning from Judith for Erica, kind of mm -hmm. about a more general, more general thing. And I think I'm going to hold that for for our for our uh, closing Q and A, if that's okay. Uh, I want to thank you, uh, Matt and Erica, for that for that run through. I uh, I still remember the moment I learned a couple of years ago about this situation with committee votes, just just could not believe it. And I'm uh, so glad for the work that you're doing. It's, uh, and I think it's, uh, it's really clear how important it is to the work that we're trying to do. So thank you. All right, uh, Jim, uh, we're gonna wrap up here with uh, ranked choice voting. Can't hear you. Here we go. I had my, oh, my microphone muted, so all right, there you go. I, I wanna, before I start sharing my screen, we're just along the lines of what you were just saying there, Kurt, um, my first foray into um, legislation stuff happened 22 years ago around the birth of my daughter. And I was involved to, because of work that my wife did, including the birthing of our daughter with a midwifery organization. And I helped draft midwifery legislation back in 1998 and I think for the first time actually passed one of the chambers of the legislature. 
22 years later. So I, I, I can certainly um, commiserate with the, uh, the, the amount of time it takes for bills to wind their way through the legislature here in Massachusetts. So, I mean, we've talked, I mean, the folks before me have talked about sort of how things are gonna happen within the legislature. Um, what we're trying to do ultimately with question two in the ballot is to make sure that the people we elect to the legislature um, represent the majority of the people in those districts and hopefully ultimately encourage more people to actually run for office because that's one of the major issues we have here in Massachusetts, uncontested elections. So let me get my screen up here and shared. Where is that? Okay, you should. And then if I go to present, hopefully we, we see a nice big yes on two on the screen. So I'm gonna sort of go through, talk about the so the reasons why we are putting forth this ballot measure, I'm happy to answer questions about mechanics, but also about why we got here. But let me just talk a little bit about our campaign and I mean, who we are and what we're, the problem we're trying to solve um, and hopefully how we get this to victory in two weeks. So the Yes on Two campaign, which came out, started off as Voter Choice Massachusetts in a small Boston office almost four years ago, we are truly a nonpartisan citizen organized ballot campaign and yes, to bring ranked choice voting uh, statewide to Massachusetts. Uh, again, the grassroots uh, sort of formed not only in Boston, but in every corner of the state and people representing Democrats and Republicans, independents, but so, truly a multi-partisan group of people who've come together to um, hopefully enact this really important electoral reform. Uh, we've heard about the signature gathering process and I, the kudos to the folks who were on the ground in both of these signature um, gathering efforts. Um, we certainly understand the challenges of electronic signature gathering. Uh, we had our first signature gathering process that was last year at this time where we had to gather over 81,000 signatures. And then in the middle of the pandemic, we had to get another 15 um, which we managed to do. And in fact, exceeded the goals um, in both signature gathering processes. So that really told us that there are a lot of people in the Commonwealth who are really interested in changing our election process to make it truly more representative um, of the will of the people. Because ultimately that's the message we need to send to the folks on Beacon Hill. So to summarize very quickly what a, a yes vote on question two would do, it would support the use of ranked choice voting in primary and general elections for federal and state offices. So it wouldn't apply to municipal elections. So that's where that local option bill that was referenced earlier would come into play. Um, it also wouldn't apply to the presidential election. There are a bunch of reasons for, uh, for that, um, somewhat tied into the how it interfaced with the Electoral College. But essentially anybody you would vote for on a November ballot, those races would be subject to ranked choice voting. So. What is the problem? So for those of you uh, watching this who may have um, may live in or near the fourth congressional district, you may have heard about this race. This is the primary for um, Joe Kennedy's seat in Congress uh, early last month where Jake Auchincloss, and I'll make note, a supporter of ranked choice voting, as are all these people, won that primary with less than 23% of the vote. Now, I certainly grew up thinking in terms of it's majority rule. You got to get a majority of the vote because that's that really expresses the will of the of the, uh, of the community that's voting for somebody. But Jake didn't even get a half of a half of the vote in that election, and so it really question the question really comes to is does Jake Alkenclaus truly represent the majority of the people in that district? And we, the answer is we just don't know. But anecdotally, we can point to a couple of interesting things. So we have Jake Auchincloss, who was the um, first place. But as you might know, there might be, there is something slightly in common about the next four candidates who garnered over 60% of the vote. And it was the four female candidates. So did the four female candidates, again, having garnered over 60% of the vote, did they somehow split the vote so that their voices, that, that they couldn't win? In, this, in our current first past the post system. And I'll also highlight the two candidates I have here in black and white, Chris Sinos and Dave Cavell. They both, backed, they both withdrew from the race before election day and endorsed Jesse Murmel, 
but they backed out of the race after mail-in voting had already begun. So people who had supported their candidacy had already voted for them. And when they withdrew from the race, those voters couldn't do anything about it. And you could see that both of them collectively garnered almost 5% of the vote, which is well in excess of the difference in the um, percentages between Jake and, and Jesse. So again, this is not to say that I know that somebody else would have won this race under a ranked choice uh, tabulation, but it does beg the question, who truly represents the majority of people in that district? And the answer is, we just don't know. Uh, and for whatever it's worth, two years ago, I had the very same thing happen up in the 3rd Congressional District where I live, where we had the, almost the exact same outcome. Candidate uh, Lori Trahan won that primary with less than 22% of the vote. So really remarkable that uh, history repeated itself. And this chart here shows we did the research to look at races that had three or more candidates in the Commonwealth over the past 20 or so years. And over 40% of the time, the winner of those races is somebody who gains less than 50% of the vote. So this is not an uncommon situation. And so how do we make sure that the people who represent us, whether it's in the federal Congress, whether it's in the general court or district attorney, as the case may be, that they truly represent the majority interests of our communities. And our current system doesn't do that. So the problem we see here with our plurality first pass the voting system, it, first of all, it fails to guarantee majority winners in our elections. It creates the issue of spoiler candidates or, or, or the, the, the argument that if you vote for somebody who might not be as well funded or as well known that you'd be wasting your vote. And that's a problem that people, and that, I mean, if you have that, if you have the context that uh, as a voter, you think I, I can't vote for them because they'll spoil it. That I'm, I, I don't, I, I, I end up having to vote for the lesser of two evils, so to speak. And that's a problem with our election system. And as you saw with Chris Sinos and Dave Cavell, uh, they had to, they dropped out of the race for worrying about splitting the vote from Jesse Mormel. And obviously the people who had voted for those candidates are all, were all of a sudden disenfranchised. And so we have a system that actually dis discourages people from running for office. Uh, it limits our choices. If there are fewer people running for office, it limits the voters' choices when it comes time to election day. And that's a problem. Again, we have, we have an awful record in terms of contested races throughout our voting, our election system here in Massachusetts. And that's something we gotta change. And because of the duopolistic impact of first past the post, it, it rewards negative campaigning. A candidate can gain almost as much benefit and perhaps even more by simply highlighting the bad things about their opponent as opposed to actually having to ca uh, campaign for something on their own. So that's just, that's just wrong. We, can, we shouldn't have that, that, you know, that sort of perverse incentive. And if you have all these problems sort of lined up on, it, on each other, it yields voter apathy. And you don't, people either don't follow the people who are running for office or just don't show up. So again, how do we solve all these problems that are baked into our existing current, existing election system? Well, we think ranked choice voting is the answer to that, or at least one of the answers that have to, uh, to improve our election system. So what is ranked choice voting? From the voter's perspective, what you, it is, is instead of voting for one candidate, the voter can rank as many candidates as they wish in the order of the voters' preference. Pretty straightforward. And then the special sauce with ranked choice voting, as opposed to our current system, is that in order to win the election, a candidate must earn over 50% support. So you cannot win an election with 22, 23%. So how does this work in practice? Well, today, just to make it clear, you've seen this, maybe some of you have already voted already. If you wanna vote for a candidate, you vote once and that's it but you can't express the nuance of your, your feelings amongst the other candidates. The ranked choice voting system, the ballot will look, will look a little bit different, but the voter will have the opportunity to rank the candidates in order their preference. And so that they may be told that Barbara Berg is the candidate you have to vote for because she's well-funded, even if you think Charlie Chang is the right candidate for you because he uh, represents what you truly believe in. Well, in a ranked choice system, the voter can actually express that preference. So tabulation wise, in a ranked election, the, the trick you have to do is see, does anybody have 
50% or more, actually over 50% of the vote. And if they do, after the first round, as shown in this example here, they win, you're over. It's just like today. If you get over 50%, you win, don't need any further tabulation. But what happens if no candidate does get that 50%? And I'll just mention that these, this tabulation you'll see here actually came from the honest to goodness ranked choice election that actually happened out in Minneapolis, Minnesota a couple of years ago. So you have four candidates. You ask the question, does anybody have a, over a majority? And in this case, the answer is no. So we have to continue the process. We actually have to enter in it to an instant runoff. And we go through that process by saying, who has the least amount of support in that first round? And in this case, it's Charlie Chang, sorry. And so what we're going to do is eliminate Charlie and take the ballots for that 11% of the ballots where Charlie Chang was the first choice, and we're gonna reallocate them to the voters um, second choice on those ballots as if we had gone back to the polls, but now with the remaining three candidates. So what happened in this particular uh, race? Well, Charlie got eliminated and the 11% was uh, allocated amongst the other three candidates. And each of the three candidates got some because the voters aren't monolithic. The, some Charlie voters like David, some like Barbara, some like Abby. So now we need to test this one more time. Does anybody have 50% of the vote? And the answer is again, no. So now we look at who's in last place. We gotta go through that instant runoff again. David is in last place. So we're now gonna reallocate the votes cast for David to the remaining two candidates. Now, it, it may be the second person on, on those ballots. It may in fact be the third. If someone had voted for David first and Charlie second, well, Charlie's already been eliminated. So now we need to go to the third choice on those ballots. So what happened in this particular election? Well, most of the ballots that had been cast for David, the next highest ranked candidate was in fact Abby. And it put her over the top, over that 50% threshold, and Abby was deemed the winner of this election. Now, just to provide a little bit of an explanation here, so it's a little under, it's understanding. This was a city council race in actuality, technically nonpartisan, but the party, the candidates had party labels. And as it turned out, Abby and David were from the same party. So it makes some sense that together, their voters would support one over the other one and then have the next one to be the highest. And so that party clearly represented a majority of the voters in the district and they had their, they were able to pick one of theirs to win. Even though in the first round, Barbara Berg under our current system who would not have been supported by a majority would have won that election. So again, we've better attuned to the interest of this district by going through this ranked choice process. So benefits to the voter. First of all, they don't have to be about worry, they don't have to worry about voting for a spoiler candidate or wasting their vote because that uh, they can express that true preference, but know that they cannot hurt their second choice by doing so. Under our current system, you can vote for a favorite candidate who might be a third party or independent, um, but have the impact of perhaps helping the candidate you like least. That's the lesser of two evils issue. You don't have to worry about that anymore. Uh, it allows the voter to rank as many or as few candidates as the voter chooses. So there's not a mandate that you have to rank nine or 10 candidates if you have a large enough field. Um, if you want to vote for only one, that's your prerogative. But no, if you only vote for one and don't rank any more, if you have to go through, if your candidate gets eliminated, it's as if you didn't show up for the following runoff election. And certainly with all these benefits, it gives the voters more choice and it's certainly a stronger voice um, in, their, uh, in their government. Um, and I believe even if you vote for a losing candidate, I believe it helps because it informs the winning candidate about the real interest in that district. If a losing can, I mean, a third party candidate today might get three or 4%. If you free the voters up to vote their true preference, if all of a sudden that third party gets 15, 20%, they may not win, but now we know in that district, it has a very strong, it may have a strong leaning toward making more green candidates or more libertarian candidates or what have you. The winners in these elections go into their government, uh, their, their position in government, knowing that they have majority support from their district. Um, you don't have the worries about candidates splitting votes. So you won't have candidates feel like they have to leave 
uh, the race. So you got to make, to make sure that their voices remain heard and maybe they have good ideas that need to be heard in a campaign. And perhaps more important than almost anything else here is that because we're freeing the voters up to vote their preferences as opposed to have to worrying about uh, the strategies or the party power or financing, what have you, it will open up the campaign, the election process to fresher voices, uh, more, more candidates of color, more women candidates. Um, and that's really important. Again, in a system that has really made it difficult for people to run uh, to challenge incumbents, we want to help those people who have good ideas to get into the system and hopefully get, the, get some of those folks elected. And because we have this interest amongst the candidates to not only seek out the first votes, but second or even third or further votes down, the candidates are more likely to find common ground when campaigning. That they, rather than bashing their opponents, they might say, hey, you may like Mary Jones, but hey, Mary Jones and I have good ideas together. So while I'd like you to make me your first choice, if you like Mary Jones, at least make me her second choice. And if you, in a system where you're negative, you might not do that. So we find, I mean, we have a benefit here of changing the nature of our elections through ranked choice voting. So quickly, um, just wanted to say that we have a, an illustrious group of people, a multi-partisan collection of folks who, um, who have come out in favor of supporting ranked choice voting. We have both Deval Patrick and Bill Weld, a Democratic and Republican former governors. We have Tanisha Sullivan, the head of the NAACP. Uh, we have Adrian Madaro uh, from the first Suffolk district uh, in East Boston, who's been a real champion. I could point to Steve Paliuka, managing partner of the Boston Celtics, but I'm gonna actually point to Mike Zarin, who's the assistant GM of the Celtics, who's been, who's been a fantastic um, member of our team. So a really interesting and, and, and engaged group of people who are um, out there supporting this effort on question two. And here you can see the, um, the, the laundry list um, of folks who have endorsed uh, ranked choice voting. Um, I'm hoping that we don't have to add your list to the, your name, Erica, to this list because it will win, we'll win. So we'll be able to simply say, Erica supported us when we won in this election. But we have, I mean, you have both of our um, sitting US senators, um, Ed Markey and Elizabeth Warren, and actually just found out today that Ed Markey's doing a, a phone bank for us, I think either tomorrow or uh, Wednesday, can't remember which, but we're gonna get Ed Markey on the phone for us shortly. Uh, Attorney General Maura Healy, Bill Galvin, believe it or not, is supportive of ranked choice voting. So it's a really fantastic and, and, and broad coalition of folks we've put together in support of question two. So how do we win in two weeks? Well, hopefully if you haven't voted already, please vote. And yeah, vote yes on two. Um, but certainly you can go out there. We're gonna have visibility events happening around the state as we go through the early voting period and certainly on election day. Uh, if you're interested in getting a lawn sign, you can go to our website, yes on two rcv.com, sign, fill in a, a form and you can either find out where you can pick a sign up or get one delivered to you. Uh, and then certainly if you're not spending time doing the work on the other two uh, ballot questions, which are fantastic, I'm thrilled that um, the 350 Mass and uh, ACT UP uh, Mass are, have, have put those out there. But if you have some extra time to volunteer, to make some phone calls, to send out some texts or what have you, please um, do so. So that's my story. I'll stop sharing and would okay. love to take some questions. Thank you, Jim. On the uh, on the street sign or on the yard sign thing, I just picked one up today. There's a super easy map where you can just walk up on somebody's porch and grab one. It's, uh, it's great. Thank I you. I live in Stowe. I've got a bunch organized. on my porch. So yeah. if you come apple picking, come get a sign. So yeah, yeah. Um, so um, let's see. Uh, do I think there's a question from Ben about. Uh, your talk, Jim. Please. And I want to, um, there's a question specifically for Erica and she's got to leave a few minutes early. So um, let's, let's, uh, let's hit the, the gym question here first. Um, question from Ben, uh, can results be tabulated without computers or is there a paper audit trail for the results? Did I get that right, Ben? Yeah, so the, the tabulation, if we go through, well, first of all, on election night, um, city and town clerks will tabulate the votes as they do today. The, the election night tabulation does not change. 
So if that's done through whatever machines that they have, that's, that's what would happen. Uh, the rank tabulation would only come into play in the races where one rank choice voting applies. So you need to have three or more candidates. And in fact, nobody in that race gets over 50%. That's where there will be some computerization involved because um, we'll, we'll need to basically compile the data from throughout the district. So if it's just a state rep district, obviously a little smaller. If it's statewide, it's gonna be a bigger, bigger production. Uh, but the tabulation would be done by computer but we're not changing the underlying ballots. So in terms of having a, a paper trail, we would still be able to go back to individual ballots and look at them to make sure that's, that's right. Uh, but one thing you might see, and while this may not be directly your question, Ben, but um, the Secretary of State up in Maine, when they have done their ranked tabulations, not only has the uh, state released the round by round results, how you actually got from round one to round N determining the winner, but they've actually released a spreadsheet of all the ballots. So you could actually independently confirm anywhere you wanted to that that tabulation process. So in terms of transparency, I see Erica smiling here, um, that it was a, when that came out, so wow, to actually, I mean, rather than people saying, oh, this is a hidden process. They just said, nope, you can do the tabulation yourself. And I would love to think that the secretary's office would uh, embrace that sort of concept. So again, not directly responsive to your question, Ben, but I thought I'd mention it. Yeah, all right, thank you. Um, so there was a question from Judith uh, early on um, for Erica, let me just read it out. Um, she says, wonderful people have run and entered the state house and within a few years, the tight hierarchy and culture beat them down and you don't hear those wonderfully strident voices calling for change. How can you and others entering support one another, stay strong, and make the challenges we are talking about? Mm, that's such a great question. Um, I'm curious because I think if Judas is referring to kind of like why, um, you know, some state reps who ran on these incredibly progressive platforms, even running on things like transparency flip, right? because um, eventually the, the system and the institution essentially breaks them. Um, there's a few things happening there, which I'll just share with everyone. Um, you know, one, yes, the, the bullying and the, you know, there's sort of a human aspect of this work, right? That isn't just kind of the, you know, Matt and I presented a very logical, here's the structure, here's how it all works. And then in practice, right, in the state house, when you enter, um, there's just an in intense and immense amount of bullying. Um, the culture there is supremely, uh, I say it's run like a corporation, um, which it is. Um, there's, it's almost as if like Bob DeLeo is our CEO and there are sort of like, you know, division chairs, you know what I mean? And that essentially like you'd see like vice presidents and sort of the sort of hierarchical control that corporations um, as well as plantations and mobs and all that like different structures exhibit. Um, the state house entirely exhibits that. Um, and that human side of it is that, you know, the way they maintain control over their reps is by immense amount of bullying and just, you know, emotional abuse. Um, and some people just say, you know what, I'm tired of having such an antagonistic experience here. Um, and, you know, I think a lot of times too, uh, one of the problems I mention a lot is, uh, and particularly this has been the case with my district, is that you don't, you know, as a rep, almost don't get exposure to the reason why you ran in the first place, right? Like the constituents who are happy with you are not reaching out to you with all their joy <laughs> about why they supported you. Um, and instead they spend all their time, you know, being bullied by other members of the state house. So, um, you know, there is an out element of, um, you know, the need to stay connected to your community as a rep to stay in a sense, sane in this dynamic, in this, this environment. Um, I think also having support of constituents is really important. I mean, my goal, uh, particular or not goal, I should objective is that I need to stay very connected to the people who elected me and keep them engaged in the process. Otherwise, um, you know, you're going to lose your mind in there. Um, and so I think that's one thing that just like state reps should do in general. Um, and that's why it's so important to run and also support grassroots run campaigns, because that means you have a much bigger network that is really supporting you through this work. Um, and then I'll just say one last thing in terms of like sort of the more, 
I say like less charitable view of what happens, right? In the sense that, you know, some people run on these incredibly progressive platforms, maybe the system breaks them, but they also essentially turn their back on the movement, right? And they turn their back on the people who elected them to begin with. Um, and that's actually a, a very, uh, um, how to say it? I say thoughtful process of how like the speaker and house leadership maintains control in the state house is that they love having a progressive cover, right? They don't like the speaker isn't just like has control because he's just this mean guy, right? That's not how it works, right? He has support and has votes across the, the political spectrum. Um, and having a progressive cover is incredibly uh, advantageous. Having someone who represents the most progressive district, right? and represents all these progressive values saying that, hey, everything in the state house is going great, is exactly what he needs, right, to maintain power. Um, and so the way that happens, right, is that there is this power brokering um, of essentially get rewarded more and more for essentially turning your back on your constituents and supporting the speaker. Um, and the more trouble you cause, right, or the more progressive you are, the, the greater that reward is for the speaker because then he's neutralized. And we actually saw this happen uh, in this election for 2020. Um, and you can look at some endorsements to, to look at that. But, um, you know, that's just an example of essentially that's the, the, the power House leadership yields, right? They get to decide what we vote on. They get to decide what bills pass. And eventually that temptation becomes too great that, you know, people are like, tired of feeling like I'm getting nothing done. Um, and in reality, what I say to that is there's a difference between power and permission, right? Because you didn't actually, if you got the bill done because you got to be the progressive cover for speaker in exchange, right? You didn't actually gain power doing that. You got the speaker's permission. He can dispose of you anytime. You are, you are disposable as a, as a rep, um, rank and file rep. Um, and so, you know, that's something that we see over and over again, like, you know, there's this sort of narrative that like, if you're holding a committee chair, you're sort of working your way up the state house and being effective and getting things done. Um, but that's not actually power, that's, that's getting permission to be complicit with the system. Um, and we see that kind of misunderstanding often, right? Um, I know that my predecessor, I don't know if anyone, I mean, I'm sure everyone, like Denise Provo, who I think actually held a lot more power than people give her credit for. People have criticized her saying, well, she never held a committee chair, so she didn't really get anything done. Um, but again, they're confusing power with permission. And there are many reps who have permission, um, but they don't have any power. Um, that's something that's also, I think I share that because I think it's something that we as advocates, activists, constituents need to be able to see through that difference between power and permission if we're gonna actually change how the state house works and how reps are rewarded or punished for what they do, because that's where the power of constituents is so important. Because that's the counter, bearing, the, a counter um, weight to what the speaker holds, right? Is that ultimately the constituents decide if I get to keep this job or not. And that's actually how things work and that's what matters. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, it's really good to be clear eyed about that situation. and. Uh, very much appreciate Erica uh, sharing your perspective, and uh, you know we're all uh, you know we're all excited for uh, for what's to come. Uh, all right, so we're basically out of time here. Um, I'll give our panelists just if they want to share one last thought on anything, you know, just a you know just a quick statement if you want. Uh, ben, Cobble, anything you want to uh, want to close on? Yes, thank you, Kurt. And thanks to everyone who spent this evening with us. I know there's a lot of activity going on with phone banking um, and such. So I really appreciate everyone who joined us tonight. And I'm going to have Sam put in a link into the chat because on the weekends, or it doesn't even have to be the weekends actually, it could be during the week, whenever you're free. Um, we are doing door hangers. We're putting door hangers in, in Lowell in Tom Golden's district. So we could really use some help up there because we want to send him a message. He is an important person to get that message, probably the most important. So Sam will put that link in the chat for you and please share it too. Feel free to share it um, wherever we can get people and whenever we can get people, we're happy to have you. And we've got some signs too that, that we uh, could hand out to you if you're going to be doing any sign holding on election day. 
and just, uh, and again, thanks everybody for spending your evening with us. Thanks. Yeah, our Lowell, our Lowell chapter is not known as the fight in Lowell no, node for nothing. So, good. Uh, Matt, Erica, any uh, closing comments? I, I think Erica put everything better than I could, but just thank you all for what you're doing. All these questions are really important. Okay, great, thanks. Uh, Jim? I, again, I appreciate the opportunity to chat with you all tonight. And I mean, no matter how we vote, I think the quick answer is just go vote. <laughs> and, uh, but yes, please vote yes on two as well. Yeah, yeah, well said. Uh, there's a question just in the chat there. Um, uh, the link to volunteer in Lowell. Um, sorry, these things keep going to uh, just the panelists. <laughs> yes on, yeah. Pop it in there. If you see yes yeah. on three golden, that's your link. Yeah, there we go, yeah. Um, and I'll just quickly say, this is the second of a three webinar series about the kind of legislative process, you know, starting with where we where we are in the session, you know, at this moment. Now these, you know, these, these other ways to get in and influence through ballot questions. And we'll be wrapping up on Monday, November 16th, uh, with a session entitled Roadmap and Roadblocks, Accelerating Passage of Climate Legislation, because we're in this for the long haul, right? And uh, we're going to step back and take a, a little bit kind of broader view of the situation on trying to craft this climate legislation that we all know that we need. We know it's, you know, it's taken way too long, uh, but we're in there and we're going to be working with the situation to make it happen. Uh, so with that, uh, again, uh, thank you all so much for, for attending. Um, spread the word to uh, your friends and colleagues who couldn't make it tonight. I think there'll be a video that will be released and uh, spread it around. And I uh, hope to see you on the, on the 16th. Have a good night. Thank you all. Bye-bye.